so excited to introduce Keith Hughes. So Keith is an educator, a YouTuber, and quite, quite frankly, an innovator in the field of technology and education. Uh, he's a 16-year veteran of the Buffalo Public Schools, uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Buffalo. He's a producer of Hip Hughes History, and he's a YouTube Edu Guru Award winner. Um, I've had the privilege to, to, to hear Keith speak at a number of occasions. It's always entertaining, it's always fun, and I always learn something great. So Keith, excited to turn it over to you. Thanks for joining, and uh, we'll, we'll let you take it away. All right, there we go. I think that um, I am ready for you guys. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as Peter introduced me, uh, my name is Keith Hughes, and uh, we're going to be talking today about um, not just video, but about teaching in general. But I know um, a lot of people are having hybrid classes and um, trying to figure out ways to deliver instruction to the kids is becoming really, really important. And uh, that's one of my passions is uh, delivering content to kids in order for them to do things like create content. So we're gonna be talking about learning and teaching and um, I'll have a little demo um, with an app that I've been using called Play Posset to try to make video a little bit more engaging for kids. Um, so I am gonna share my screen if I haven't done that already. Um, let's see what we got here, there we go. So everybody I hope can see my presentation and um, yeah. yeah, excellent. So um, you'll notice right away, uh, you, whenever I do anything, I'm really uh, trying to utilize what I call multimodal literacy. Um, and that's going to be true when I talk about video or when I'm doing presentations or if I'm in front of kids. Um, it's really important to me, and I think it should be important to all educators, to think just beyond what our voice is doing and to think about animation and sound and color and movement and tone and accent and all the things that we have um, kind of at our fingertips in order to engage kids. So um, I do a lot of teacher tips on Twitter. You can probably search hashtag teacher tips and I think I have a thousand. How the heck I did a thousand? I don't even know, but I think there's a thousand. So I'm gonna throw a few of those in there just to break up the presentation a little bit. And um, I will have that question box open and I'll be probably asking a few questions here and there. Um, so I'll try and check that as we go along. So let's see if we can hit a button here. There we go. Um, I don't want to talk about me too much. I think that Peter did a pretty good job of that. Um, so I've been in the district 22 years now. Peter was right. I taught 16 years in the district. So I want to make sure everybody knows that I've earned my classroom stripes um, teaching U.S. history and AP government at a very diverse uh, urban school in the middle of Buffalo called McKinley High School. Um, and then I kind of switched over. Um, I miss kids dramatically, um, but I'm working as an ITC in the district now. I specialize in video production, but I also do coaching and helping teachers, um, especially now with, with COVID and everybody kind of doing the, the at-home learning thing about how to engage kids at school. And I'll talk about some of those other uh, nuggets in there like flipping and, and YouTube. And uh, we're gonna talk about Project Imagine a little bit at the end of this as well. So let me just kind of keep clicking buttons and I'll make sure that I share this presentation at the end in the chat box. So if you wanna go back to this, uh, you can click all of the buttons and the links and have fun. All right, so here's one of my favorite teacher tips. I always like starting like this. Um, it's the only one that's in order because it really is the first one. Um, at the end of every video, and I've done 600 videos on YouTube. Again, I don't know how and I don't know when, but there's like 600 videos up there. But uh, attention is always kind of my main focus. Uh, attention is the fuel of learning. It's the energy of learning. It's the magic of learning. Um, and one of my favorite teacher tips is teaching is like flying a kite where wind is attention. So I don't care how good you are at kite making. Um, if you can't conjure up wind, the chances of learning are minimal. So I always kind of go back to that concept that especially when we're talking about video today and choosing video or creating video, whether you plan on delivering content by recording yourself or finding somebody else, that finding ways to engage kids' attention with those videos um, is of the utmost importance. So we're gonna click a button. Um, and then one more teacher tip before we dive into some things. Um, if, and I tell new teachers this all the time. If you love your content more than love, you love teaching, it's gonna be a long slog. Um, not every kid, you already know this, is gonna love math, it's gonna love history, it's gonna love what you're teaching. So it's so important that we really focus on 
um, how to facilitate learning experiences rather than how to be transfers of content knowledge. Um, we're social studies teacher. Content is as important as it is ever today. I want kids to know um, what the Constitution says, and I want them to know how the electoral process works, and I want them to know all about the War of 1812. But I realize that not every kid is going to have their their uh, you know their heart turned on by that. So I really try my best to uh, focus on engagement and facilitating that learning experience. So no matter what the content is, my kids are going to be engaged. So I have a question, and let's see if this question box works so people can answer this. And here's my question. How long can a kid pay attention? This is not a rhetorical question. So let me see if we can get some answers in there. I think I did that right. Absolutely, folks. If oh, you'll absolutely. just look for the questions. Oh, they're coming in. Great. Oh, it's working. Look at this technology. So let's see, Merrill says four minutes, Kyle says five minutes, 10 minutes, six minutes, for hours if they're interested. That's the closest answer to the correct answer. I gotta take my glasses off to say Nason uh, and Melissa and a couple of others got it right. Have you ever seen a kid play Xbox? I've seen kids soil themselves playing Xbox. Kids' attention will go as long as it's being engaged and as long as you have buy-in. Um, so kind of this old formula we use where you take their age and divide it in half and add it. A 14-year-old can pay attention for 21 minutes. That goes out the window. I don't want us to think like that as teachers. Um, it's certainly more difficult to engage kids in a history lesson than them playing Xbox. But if we limit ourselves by um, believing that, then uh, we're not going to hold kids' attention. So I want us to believe that we can hold kids' attention as long as we're engaging them. I think that's critically important to what we do as educators. Um, here's another one. I like this one. Social studies teachers. We don't teach history, guys, ladies. We use history to teach kids how to think. And um, as I go into videos soon, I always preface it by saying that um, I might have 600 videos on the Internet, but I'm not teaching. I'm telling. Um, videos are stage one. Um, it's the introduction, it's the baseline, it's the foundation, it's what you got to know in order to do something with that content. And that's my, my favorite as part of teaching is the part that comes after they watch that video and what they do once they've learned the Bill of Rights or once they basically know what uh, Article 1 of the Constitution says or how the War of 1812 started. All right, got another question. Are you ready? Where does learning happen? Again, not rhetorical. And we're going to see what answers come up. I'm having fun doing this. This works so well. And you guys are really participating. Let's see what we got here. Oh, my gosh. I've never had someone answer it so quickly, so correct. Now, everywhere is the wrong answer. I guess it's the right answer, but that's not the answer I was looking for. And I get, I get that answer all the time. It's a good answer, but it's not the one I want. Um, I've heard in the classroom, uh, you know, everywhere, uh, when they're stuck. There's only one place that learning happens, and uh, Nathan nailed it when he said, in the student's mind, the only place that we learn is in the brain. It doesn't happen in the space between our mouths and their ears. It doesn't happen anywhere but in the context of that child's mind. So that really you know, was kind of a paradigm shifter when I really kind of soaked that up early in my career, and I realized that I had to do something in order to engage that process that went on in their brain to get them engaged, to get them making decisions. Uh, that was the way that I always evaluated myself and I recommend it, I, that you try this, you know, the ticket out the door cards and they'd ask the kids, you know, after the lesson, why did the war of 1812 start? And the kids would write their answers and you'd be able to look and say, now I know if I taught them something. I would ask them, just give me an estimate guys, how many decisions do you think you made today? And then anonymously, I just look at the cards my job was to make that number go up. And if we think about what um, education, you know, maybe we, we learned about in college or we did 30 years ago, kids weren't making really any decisions. They were sitting passively in their chairs, listening to our lectures, filling out their notes, checking the boxes, getting the multiple choice question maybe right. But they really weren't, um, you know, owning that learning process. So that's a really, really important concept to me. So I started calling myself a full. Um, I am a facilitator of learning experience, 
uh, rather than a teacher, because I really have a hard time explaining to non-teachers, sometimes to teachers, what the heck we do. Um, I can't explain what it means to teach somebody, but I, I do know what it means to facilitate a learning experience. So in my mind, I stopped thinking of a teacher as being that Mick Jagger, um, and I can sing a song in front of the classroom, and I'm sure a lot of us can as well, but I wanted to be Carl Bernstein. I wanted to be Bugs Bunny in that, in that slide. I wanted to be the one that facilitated that learning experience. Um, and that's why I created the videos. I'm gonna go into that. It wasn't to teach them. It was to set up that learning experience. So um, I think I might've been one of the earlier flippers. Um, uh, we've probably all heard that word before, but um, in a traditional classroom, what flip classroom means was that I was gonna stop lecturing and, and talking about content in front of kids. You know, that idea they weren't learning in the space between my mouth and their ear, that that was a waste of time in my classroom. I could find out ways to do that outside of the classroom. So early on, um, I burned MP3s, baby. I think back in 99, I was burning MP3s. And then I had one of those DVD burners in 2002. And I would have a kid press the button and I'd hand out the DVDs and the kids would watch it. And then eventually YouTube came out and I said, well, darn it, this is a pretty good idea. Um, and, you know, I taught in a ur big urban high school with a digital divide, but I, I, I found ways to make sure that kids had that availability to watch videos outside of the classroom. And now with COVID, uh, we're being forced to do that in a sense, to deliver content when kids aren't right in front of us. Um, but the overall theme here was that that was stage one. So when they came back to my classroom, and I think there's ways to do this when kids are at home during the COVID crisis, was to facilitate that learning experience. What were they going to do after they watched that video? Oh, I have another teacher tip. I like these. This is one of my favorite, just because I love Charlie Brown, right? Where attention goes, energy flows. Unless you have a student's authentic attention, you might as well be teaching a bag of rocks. All right, so let's talk about, um, about what makes a good video. Um, and you could go look at my YouTube site. My, I hate my nickname, Hit Pews. I don't know why I picked that, but it's too late. Um, and you can see the types of videos that I create. Um, and I'm a big believer in differentiation. You got to know your audience. And I don't work for every kid. I'm a little bit goofy. I'm a little bit silly. Um, I like teaching the kids that really don't like being in school. Um, but if you're teaching at, at an at a AP honor school, you know, it, you might look for a different kind of video. But the things that I was always thinking about when I created videos, number one was length. Um, and I break this rule all the time. I think I have like a 30 minute video, but really 10 minutes was my ceiling teaching 11th and 12th graders. And to engage kids by themselves watching a video for 10 minutes, especially when we only had passive video to choose from, um, you know, w w was the most I thought that, I, that I, I wanted to do. And I wanted to make sure that the videos that I created were easy to follow. So I always had a beginning, I always had an intro, I always tried to develop context, kind of set the stage. I had a middle where I went over what I wanted to go over and then I had a, a wrap up, but it was easy for my kids to follow. I would always have titles separating the categories. I wanted to make sure that the kids were prepared for what they were about to see. And I'm a big believer, I love the word multimodal. I gotta change my password now because that was my password, multimodality. Um, that in all of my videos, I was trying to touch every form of literacy to engage kids, to try to make them actively paying attention. And we're going to go into that app, Play Posit soon, or some of you might have used that puzzle, where I can do more things to engage kids. But I was doing it um, with titles and with jokes and with music. Uh, my big thing was I realized if I used 10 or 20 seconds, I wouldn't get copyright you know, infringed. So I use TV themes. So, you know, you watch a video and you hear something, you go, I think that's Funky Brewster, or that might be MASH, or that might be whatever kids were watching these days, we do, or whatever. And that not only broke up my content um, with those titles, but it sucked that kid's attention back in. It was a way to conjure up wind. And I think whether you're creating videos or whether you're choosing videos, <coughs> excuse me, it's really important to, to go beyond just that person talking on the screen. Um, and like, we'll, I'll talk about Khan uh, Academy videos. Khan Academy videos work for certain kids. Kids who are trying to get into a good college and know how to do traditional learning or traditional learners. They like reading notes and they like outlines and 
I don't know who these kids are, but they exist. I wasn't that kid, but those kids exist. A Khan Academy video might work for them because they're already bringing their attention. So it's easy for them to engage in kind of a PowerPointy kind of presentation. But a lot of our kids, they can't do that. So you can assign it. You can tell them to watch it. They might even watch it, but they're not really engaging and actively kind of watching that video. So uh, there's tons of YouTubers um, that you can find. Some of them are on my page on the right side. I kind of have some of my friends up there that do these forms of things to engage kids. And another big uh, point when I made videos was, or chose videos, that I wanted videos that kind of mixed academic discourse and student primary discourse. That if I was going to, you know, if you think about a discourse like astronomy, you know, I don't know much about astronomy. So if I watch a video and it's just Carl Sagan using all astrological terms and, uh, you know, formulas, I'm not going to be able to follow because I don't really have my foot in that world, in that, in that academic discourse. So I need Carl Sagan or I need Keith Hughes or whoever's talking to me to talk my language. And I don't mean talk like slang all the time, but to use analogies, to use things that I understand. So if I'm teaching the Bill of Rights, every kid knows what a shield does. I could talk about Captain America's shield and how that protects him from outside you know, forces. That's student discourse. But the Bill of Rights, I could talk now, once the kid understands that, about how it's a defense for our rights against the federal government's intrusion into our individual liberties. That's what I mean by finding videos or making videos. A lot of you are going to make videos. Of, of using what kids understand already to bring them into our world of social studies so they can have that light bulb moment. Not that they're going to learn every single word of the Bill of Rights when I teach it that way, um, but that they're going to understand enough where when they go to that next step and they start producing or making things and getting into the details, the devil of the details of the Fourth Amendment, what's unreasonable, or what does a necessary militia mean, or whatever it might be, that's when they're going to get those nuggets of content, the little pieces that are a little harder to understand. So try your best when you're finding these videos, not to do videos that go 10 feet under, you know, digging into the content, but more like a stone that skips across the water. So they understand the major kind of sea of, you know, fundamental ideas, and then I can get them to go swim in that water. And there's a lot of analogies going on today. Focus on big ideas. Make sure that your voiceover, or if you're the presenter, that you're doing what I'm doing. You're engaging. You're looking at the kid. You're using your voice. I would use accents sometimes. I'm, I live in Buffalo, and for whatever reason, whenever I say out, I have a Canadian accent. So if I'm teaching the War of 1812, I can say, you know, as the United States, you need to get out and go back to where you came from. How about that? Um, and again, uh, it, it, the videos need to serve a greater purpose. Please don't assign videos with the, with the objective of being that they're going to learn the content from the video, and then you can go to chapter two. It goes back to that facilitator of learning experience. We don't want to just yell content or show content. We want kids to use content. All right, so we're going to do a little demonstration in a second, because I've talked about making active a video active without the app yet, with just using multimodal literacy in your voice and pictures and sounds and you know everything to get that kid and that win going so the kid's going to lean in. But um, about five, six, seven years ago, these apps started coming out that um, are going to make it even more active rather than passive. So uh, there's more than a few. I, I, I wasn't going to list all of them, but you can, you can just Google um, active video questions embedded in my video and you're going to find tons of sites. But the two big ones that are kind of, you know, in the mainstream uh, lexicon right now are Edpuzzle and what used to be called Educanon or Play Posit. So I'm going to demo um, how to do that really quick. This isn't a PE, professional development seminar, where you're going to learn everything. But just to show you kind of how easy it really is, I'm going to um, kind of share my windows here and jump into Play Posit. So play posit, um, the, the video lessons are called bulbs, uh, like you're gonna grow a plant of learning or something, um, but you can sign up. I have a district account. Um, we, we don't have to go into all that. You guys can figure out how to sign up for these programs. And most of them have uh, 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 kind of lower down free levels so you can get started. Um, but basically all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit add new bulb 
and then it's going to automatically attach itself to a search engine where I can put um, a URL, I can upload a, an MP4 if I've uh, created a video in, on my PC or on my iPad or even on my phone, or I could just jump into YouTube. So if I jump into YouTube and I just type, uh, why don't we do Federalist Paper 10. That's a good one. And I think that's my video right there, yeah. So uh, Fed 10 was always so hard to teach in AP government, man. <laughs> so I really, really kind of uh, whittled it down in this seven minute video so kids understood the major, major themes. But the great thing about these programs is I'm gonna be able to pinpoint parts of the video to pause and have kids reflect, answer questions, ask questions, write short paragraphs, send them to websites, do a poll, and really get that kid engage to another level so if the kid's starting to wander off in the wind that they know there's a question coming up i need to lean in i mean it's kind of like forced attention kind of holding a weapon to them and saying look you're gonna get a grade and this is gonna count and you have to watch it you know but that's that's i've already done all those other things to get the kids attention this is just a great way for me to get feedback and get more engagement so i know if the video is working um I'm not a huge data cultist, but data is important in that respect that I need to know if kids are getting things. So I'm gonna hit done now, and you'll see that the Play Posit uh, kind of app is gonna open, and they're called interactions. So um, I have like a pirate theme going on of factions in Fed 10, but if I hit play really quick, let's play this for a few seconds. Welcome to Hippius History. So glad that you showed up again. Um, in this lecture, kind of a mini lecture, we're going to take a look at the kind of the philosophical underpinnings of Federalist Paper Number Ten. Um, and of course, the Federalist Papers are one of the most important go. series of essays that were ever written in the United States in terms of governmental papers because they're being used to persuade states to ratify the Constitution. So they're really explaining not what's in the Constitution, but why the Constitution. Add interaction, and this is where as an instructor, I could say that's really critically important. Maybe I wanna do a multiple choice question and ask what era was the Federalist Papers written in? I wanna make sure they understand this is during the Articles of Confederation that the Constitution hasn't been ratified. Maybe I wanna dig deeper and ask them a free response, or maybe I wanna send them to a website that um, you know maybe is a, a short essay about Fed 10 and have them answer a question. Um, but you could do that throughout the video. You can put in 100 questions, one question, 10 questions, and then when the kid answers it, you're going to get that data back, you're going to get that content back, and you're going to magically make what might have been a passive video experience into an active video experience. And right now, this is critical because we're, we're not, we don't have our kids in front of us every day. We can't see their faces. That's how I always use data. I'd look at a kid's face and I would know whether or not they were paying attention, whether they were actively involved. These types of apps, Edpuzzle, PlayPosit, they can really give you a leg up in doing that in this kind of home instruction phase of COVID. Or whether you're back in regular school and you're flipping your class and you're sending videos home. Um, because I really do believe that classroom time should be time where kids are making things and making decisions. Um, so I can show you just a really quick uh, 30 second video where I've embedded a couple questions. And if you wanna ask questions about this, I'll be quiet, you can play with it and then ask those questions. But I have a link because you can do public links. So here is the Bill of Rights, it's a 30 second video. And I can just share that by clicking my action button. There's a collaboration link. And now this won't collect the data, but this will allow people to at least get a get a sense of what these uh, these app videos look like. So I'm going to go to my chat box here. I think that I'm doing this right, and I'm going to put that link in and hit send. So if you guys click that link, um, I'm going to be quiet until maybe some questions pop up. Uh, why don't you go test it and see what that looks like? And I will keep my eye on the question box and answer anything that anybody wants answered. So I'll be quiet.
Um, can you share some tips for teachers who are teaching younger grades, K through three, uh, who often have lower tech skills and often need their parents' help to navigate um, to their computers? I think that if I was teaching younger kids and um, I was really choosing much shorter videos, maybe one minute videos or two minute videos, I don't even think I would, I would need the data. I think it would be enough to do a, a public link like I'm doing with you now, just to have a couple questions pop up. So all the parent has to do is in your learning management system, if it's Schoology or whatever, is click the link like, like you did here and um, at least have that experience where they can watch a short video um, or a slideshow with their parents and have just a couple questions pop up. I think that's probably what I would do. Good morning, thanks for the link. Uh, to use Play Posit or Ed Puzzle, it's interactive videos, not PowerPoints, correct? Actually, you, you, I believe there's an option in PowerPoint where you can turn it into a video. So if you have PowerPoints already and you go up to your share or your export features, there's usually a movie button where you can create a video out of your PowerPoint. So it's not going to allow you to upload a PPT into Edpuzzle or PlayPosit, but it will take that, that PowerPoint, um, and you probably could even just um, record your screen as you go through the video, the PowerPoint, and upload that, but there are ways to do that. And what I always tell the kids, if you don't understand me, Google it, how to make a PowerPoint into a movie. And I promise you, you're gonna find some answers. Um, just looking at some other questions. Can it be any video we find on YouTube or do we need to create? Yeah, any video, any video, really, um, you can use on Vimeo as well. And those search engines are right in Edpuzzle and right in PlayPosit. Um, so you can search there or go to YouTube and, you know, find that video, and grab that link, and there's an input URL uh, that you could put into these programs as well. Um, but my, my, my main push is whether you're making video or finding video, that you're thinking about those attributes I talked about before. We're not just assigning 24-minute videos of professors talking about, you know, Fed 10, but we're finding ways to deliver that content in ways that kids can uh, kind of, you know, uh, be reached. What else do we got here? Lots of questions. This is cool, but a little fast. Yeah, I know, I only got like another 10 minutes. I do go fast sometimes. Uh, when you send kids to watch videos like the Bill of Rights, do they have background knowledge beforehand? Um, that 30 second video is just kind of a sample. I have a, a, a 10 minute video on the Bill of Rights. That would be my introduction. Um, now, if I was at a hybrid flipping class and I had kids in front of me, yeah, I'd still lecture for a few minutes. I, I want to make sure they get the gist of it that I might assign the video, but I want these videos to be able to exist on their own. So if an alien clicked on my Bill of Rights in 10 minute video, they're going to understand it because when I talk about the, uh, the, 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 the Fifth Amendment or the Fourth Amendment or the Eighth Amendment, I'm talking about it like they have no academic discourse. So they just understand the big concept and then I kind of dig a little bit into the academic discourse before I let them go and do things with that content. Um, let me see. I think this would be crucial since uh, so many skip the task. Yeah, kids are little cheaters sometimes. Does this platform have a leaderboard to encourage students to engage more? That I do not know the answer of. I think Ed Puzzle does. I don't think Play Posit does. Uh, can this be applied to math, showing examples one at a time? I believe so. Absolutely. Um, especially if you can input those math formulas. I took casino gambling as my math credit in college, so I might not be the guy to ask about math, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Um, how do you make videos and put in the questions? Um, well, you're gonna make the video first, you're gonna upload that video, and then you're gonna put those questions inside the app like I just demonstrated. Uh, for my kinders, I'd like to do something example with letters and sound and have kids to stop answering questions. That's easy breezy cover girl to do that. Um, what will students have on their device to be able to see this uh, unsupported browser? Uh, it, that just could be a tech issue. Uh, I would recommend uh, updating the browser or using a different browser. I use Chrome, um, but if you're using an old version of something, it might not have the right attributes that'll run the tech. But if you try a few different browsers, I'm sure you're gonna find one that works. Um, yeah, absolutely. I have a question from Marissa asking about special ed students, and I can show you right here. Um, when I'm in that player right there, there's an option button, 
Um, I think I actually have to get into a different place. Like when I finish the video and I go to review, there is a playback option uh, choice right here that allows learners to rewind the videos, to skip interactions, to fast forward. And absolutely, um, if I was, I taught special ed kids, I never had a special ed kid fail my state exam. I want them to rewind it a thousand times. I don't care. I want them to rewind it until they watch it enough. You know, if they're rewinding and watching it, they're engaged. So absolutely, absolutely. A couple more questions and then I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to jump back into my presentation. Uh, what do you use to record videos? Um, I've been doing this for a long time. So um, if I was getting started out today, I, I, I could use whether it's a uh, uh, an online program where there's like we video or if I had a phone I could download iMovie and make it on there um, or on an iPad um, I'm at the next level at this point so I'm using Final Cut Pro with my Mac and um, if you go through my website on my YouTube I have videos that show you how to do it you can type in how to make a video hit views and I have a few that'll pop up I have one for iMovie and one for Final Cut um, I don't have one for Movie Maker and I refuse to make one um, when you provide the checks in the video, is there feedback from the students on interruptions being distracted from the whole video idea? If you ask it, there is. Yeah, there's a, there's feedback questions you can put in where your kids just pop in their thoughts. Uh, where does it send your data? So it sends the data, I'm not going to have time to show you, but into what's called your dashboard. Um, and you can click it. It'll show you not only how long the kid watched the video, but obviously it'll break down item analysis wise. Every question that you put in there, um, unless it's a free response and you have to read it and grade it yourself, um, but that data is pretty visual. There's bar graphs. It's downloadable. You can show your administrators. Here's my data. I have a funny data joke, but maybe I'll tell that at the end. Um, I'm going to run out of time, so um, I'm going to kind of jump back into my presentation, and then you're always welcome to email me or Twitter. Twitter uh, message me. I'm Hit Hughes on Twitter. I check that often. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and send me questions. I'll answer them, you know, whenever I get a chance on Twitter for sure. So we're going to jump back into the presentation because I'm going to run out of time eventually and see what else I got as I have about 10 minutes to talk, 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 talk. So um, I hope that helps some of you at least kind of lean into what Play Posit and Edpuzzle and some of these other programs can offer you during this COVID crisis or whether you're teaching in a regular classroom and you're trying to flip your lessons, I want to talk a little bit about what comes after the video. Um, I already did that. That was the link. We already did that. Good. So my thing was, was video. I wanted kids not to watch video. I wanted kids to make video. And, I, and, and, and there's lots of other projects you can have kids do, especially from home. Have them make websites. Uh, there's uh, easy, easy places to make websites. Make a website. Make a social media account. Um, as Alexander Hamilton, make a meme, draw a picture, do a cartoon. But video was a super tool for me because I knew what it did for me. I knew how much thought and decision making went into making a video. So when I would assign a video and I have kids make videos, I had uh, taught 16 years. Um, I think we did about a thousand videos. Kids made a thousand videos in my class. And when I shared this presentation, I don't have time to show you some of them. Um, there, some of them are awesome and some of them aren't, but they were all making decisions. And if you want to talk about differentiated learning, <laughs> there's no other place to go than video. You have a kid who needs to research. You have a kid that has to write. You have a kid that needs to be the tech kid, the camera kid, the acting kid, the, the, the producer kid, the kid who presents it to the class. There's all of these different roles that go into creating video that I knew every kid was going to be engaged whether they loved history or hated history. And every kid was going to be using the content. I'm going to curse just two times because you're not kids, right? I always said that I, I don't want kids just to eat shit, eat content. I want kids to eat shit to make shit. I want kids to eat stuff to make stuff. And for me, video did that. Um, and anybody who's just getting started, um, you can look at this later. I will share this. But I did things called quilts where I would bookend a video. I would you know, open up a video by saying, today we're going to meet old dead Americans who wrote the Constitution. Let's go do it now. And then I would assign kids, you be Hamilton and you're going to be Jefferson and you're going to be Madison. And then they would do little 10 second videos and kind of string it together. 
So they still have that experience of being engaged and we had final products. I had a show called Old Dead Americans. How about that? Uh, we're going to keep clicking as we run out of time. Here's a, here's a couple teacher tips just to make you smile. Uh, give kids random compliments because they can shift a kid's day. Uh, otherwise, you're choosing not to. And honestly, that's pretty mean. Um, I became a teacher not because I wanted kids to know the Bill of Rights. I do. I became a teacher of facilitative learning experiences because I, I knew that some kids never got seen. I knew that kids never heard a loving voice. I knew that some kids needed that. And uh, that was that was my main job was to make sure kids knew that they were valuable, that they were seen and that they meant something to be in this world. So anytime that I could, I would. And I think that you should too. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Project Imagine. Um, I, I work for Savas. Um, I'm part of what's called Project Imagine, which is an interactive uh, kind of choose your own. Remember the choose your own adventure books when you were a kid? Turn to page 40 if you want to go to the right hallway. And remember that? It's kind of like that to a super level where I, I uh, me and uh, another teacher do the video introductions for concepts in history and global studies. And then there are live maps. There are 3D interactive virtual tours. There's parts where you take on decision-making as Harry Truman or different characters in history. And it's that multimodal literacy that I was talking about before where kids are being engaged, they're making decisions, and they're really kind of swimming in the water rather than just skipping stones. So I've provided some links and I'll share that with you where you can check out Project Imagine because um, I wouldn't sign up for something if it didn't align with my educational philosophy. If anything, I think, and I hope that you guys can feel my passion for our profession that I know many of you have. And uh, I wouldn't put my name on something that I didn't believe um, aligned with those sorts of ideals that I've already been talking about in this presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share this presentation. I'm going to keep clicking buttons. Uh, but these are the modules and the immersiveness that I talked about before and how Project Imagine and Savas has done that with Project Imagine. Um, I already did that one. All right. One last teacher tip, just because Chris Farley is really funny. Don't make empty threats because once you don't follow through, you might as well quit and go live in a van down by the river. Um, so that's my presentation. There's probably a few minutes extra and I can answer some questions. Um, I'm going to, before I do that, share this presentation in the chat window so you can bookmark it or grab it and take a look at some of the links and the videos that are embedded. Um, but certainly, um, subscribe to my YouTube. We uh, we have about a quarter million subscribers. Uh, we do about 30,000 views a day. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm helping lots of teachers facilitate that introductory kind of idea um, lesson um, you know, uh, uh, in their classroom or being sent home. I'm on Twitter at Hip Hughes. Just type in Hip Hughes, I hate saying that, and you'll find my stuff for a show. And I think that's it, I'm gonna hit escape. What I'm gonna do really quick is just, I'm gonna share this so I can grab the link for you folks. So we're gonna copy that link. Uh, anybody with the link will be able to watch that now. Let's copy that. I'm gonna go into the chat window here and paste that. And there we go. Um, I'm gonna be quiet as I look at some questions and I see, uh, that Peter is back looking at me a little funny because I'm a little bit weird. Hi, Peter. Keith, no, I'm, I'm definitely not looking at you funny. I'm admiring the shirt, though. That's really what... Oh, uh... banana shirt. I just had a birthday, <laughs> and my daughter has bought That's me right. a banana shirt, so I've been listening to Harry Belafonte all morning getting ratty. I'll sing a part. Ready? What's it? Six foot, seven foot, eight foot punch. <laughs> <laughs> It's Keith, I'll tell you, app, right? yeah, we had one one concerned participant who saw a, a, a shadow in your back. It looks like I, 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 I assured them it was maybe more of a cutout. Is that fair to say? Where Somebody back by your door? No, back by your, your main door. Somebody was concerned. Is there a cutout back there? Oh, that's Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I thought so. Somebody was concerned. So I, I assured them that uh, <laughs> this is first ever on the symposium, everybody. Here we've got running to get a, a cardboard cutout, but I love it. <laughs> there it is, it is Abraham Lincoln, all right. <laughs> I do, well, hey, I, I said, you know, I do love my content and, and teaching, so. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, a couple of questions for you in the Whova app. Um, how do you differentiate your videos and do you for, for, for different learners? 
Um, yeah, well, I, I would always assign my videos, but I would also cr uh, create a list of other resources that if kids wanted to watch those videos. Um, so I, I, I taught AP government. So even in AP government, I had some kids that just didn't didn't want to watch me be silly all the time. So um, I would hook up. Actually, I would use Tom Ritchie videos sometimes. Um, Tom Ritchie is a good friend of mine. Um, he's a little bit more on the serious side sometimes, but he's a funny guy. Uh, but his videos are much more academic discourse orientated. He's going to talk much more about philosophical underpinnings and things that uh, kids that uh, can can learn that way uh, could could do. So I would differentiate my my lessons by offering a resource link of other videos they could watch. Perfect, perfect. No, I think that that's I think that that's really great. And I, you kind of address this. Another, I, I think somebody asked for maybe a K two. Somebody asked for preschoolers. Uh, again, I mean, I think the content changes, but but I would imagine in terms of creating videos for preschoolers and engaging them, the yes. same principles align, but but just the, the yeah. content is... And I, I think for younger not. kids especially, I believe for older kids too, but I think the human face is important. I, I think that kids need a face. I think they need to look at somebody um, because there's so much multimodality in your face and expressiveness. And younger kids especially, they need to look in your eyes. So I would recommend, especially if you're creating your own videos, um, even if you're doing PowerPointy kind of things, at least start the video looking at the camera, looking at the kid, um, knowing that they're probably looking right back at you like you're looking at me right now. Um, so I, I, I can talk the way I need to talk to that kid. I always say you got to meet people where they are and not where you want them to be. Um, so whether that's a kindergartner, and I taught third grade. It was my first year. They let me teach third grade. I was subbing in an international school of refugees. Um, and man, did I learn a lot because no one talked English and they were little kids. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I developed into the teacher I am, because I learned that I had to teach and facilitate um, with more than just words. And I think for younger kids, that's that's important as well. No, I, I think that that's I think that that's great advice and, and, and true for, as you mentioned earlier, if you have special education students or whatnot, kind of meeting them where they are. I think that that's that's such a great reminder. Well, Keith, this this has been fantastic. I mean, the feedback has, is just is just so thankful and appreciative of the work that you're doing. Um, just a reminder to everybody, we will, Keith posted his slides here. We're also going to post them along with a recording of this session into the into the Whova app. Uh, when I say Whova, W-H-O-V-A. Um, and uh, so that's the like Al Pacino in that movie, Son of a Woman. What's that? Like Al Pacino in Son of a Woman. Oh, <laughs> exactly. All right. I'm done with bad jokes. I'm sorry. I, I can't compete with a video guy like you. I, you're you're going to get me every time. But uh Hey, this 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 was this was absolutely great. Um, we really do appreciate it. Do follow Keith on on Twitter. He does a great job of updating things. And Keith, speaking of Twitter, are you did you celebrate a birthday this week? Uh, my birthday was uh, Tuesday. I thought. Hey, I'm sorry, right. I thought I saw somebody. Yeah, my birthday. Oh, so happy birthday. Twenty six. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, happy birthday. Hey everybody! Thank you again. We're gonna start. We're thank gonna you. start our breakouts here in about ten minutes. Uh, please join those, and uh, and then we'll come back at the end of the day with Kathy Swan and talk the C three framework and and get some great feedback from her as well. So Keith, thank you so much, um, and to all the participants, thank you for the great work that you're doing. So all right. be well. Good luck out there, folks. Be safe.